This is Unsung History, the podcast where we discuss people and events in American history that haven't always received a lot of attention. I'm your host, Kelly Therese Pollack. I'll start each episode with a brief introduction to the topic and then talk to someone who knows a lot more than I do. Be sure to subscribe to Unsung History on your favorite podcasting app so you never miss an episode. And please, Tell your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, maybe even strangers to listen to. Today we'll be talking about African-American activist, writer, teacher, and lawyer, Marianne Shad Carey, who is considered to be the first Black woman to publish and edit a newspaper in North America. Marianne Shad was born on October 9, 1823 in the slave state of Delaware, the first of 13 children born to free African Americans, Abraham Doras Shad and Harriet Burton Parnell. Her parents were dedicated abolitionists, and Abraham was a conductor on the Underground Railroad, and later president of the National Convention for the Improvement of Free People of Color in Philadelphia. The family moved to Westchester, Pennsylvania, when it became illegal to educate African-American children in Delaware. Although her family was Catholic, Marianne attended a Quaker boarding school. After her own schooling was completed, Shad turned to educating other children, first establishing a school for African-American children in Eastchester, Pennsylvania, and later teaching in Norristown, Pennsylvania and in New York City. In 1848, abolitionist Frederick Douglass asked in his North Star newspaper for readers to suggest ways of improving life for African Americans. Shad wrote a long letter to the newspaper, a portion of which was published. Her message, quote, We should do more and talk less. We have been holding conventions for years. We have been assembling together and whining over our difficulties and afflictions, passing resolutions on resolutions to any extent. But it does really seem that we have made but little progress considering our resolves. In 1850, a new Fugitive Slave Act was passed in Congress. This was not a new concept. The Constitution included a fugitive slave clause that stated that no person held to service or labor would be released from enslavement in the event that they escaped to a free state. In 1793, Congress enacted the first Fugitive Slave Act, which allowed enslavers or their agents the right to search for escaped slaves within free states. There was widespread resistance to the 1793 Fugitive Slave Act. In 1850, as part of a compromise to try to keep the southern states in the Union, a new Fugitive Slave Act was passed, which compelled citizens to assist in the capture of escaped slaves and denied enslaved people the right to a jury trial. Passage of this new act made life difficult for families like the Shads, who helped escaped slaves on the Underground Railroad, and could even result in the kidnapping of free black people into slavery, since there would be no jury trial. With the passage of this act, Marianne Shad felt that her options, and those of all African Americans, would be better in Canada, and she moved to Ontario which was then called Canada West. She settled in Windsor, across the border from Detroit, where she founded a racially integrated school, supported in part by the American Missionary Association. In 1852, she published a pamphlet entitled A Plea for Emigration, or Notes on Canada West, to encourage more African Americans to emigrate to Canada. In 1853, Shad founded her own newspaper, 
the provincial freeman. So that the newspaper would not be dismissed as the work of a woman, Shad persuaded a black abolitionist named Samuel Ringold Ward to help publish it, along with white clergyman Rev. Alexander MacArthur. Although their names were on the masthead, Shad was the main force behind the paper. The first prototype issue was published on March 24, 1853, in Windsor, with the phrase, Union is Strength, under the nameplate. After a summer lecture tour in the United States, Shad moved the publication of the Provincial Freeman to Toronto, which had a larger population to support the paper. A year after the prototype issue had appeared, the paper launched in Toronto and settled into a weekly publication schedule, with new issues every Saturday. In summer 1854, Marianne's sister, Amelia Shad, had arrived to fill in for Marianne while she was away on fundraising trips. In March of 1855, their brother Isaac joined the paper to sell subscriptions. Over time, Shad was more public about her identity, openly revealing in print that she was the editor, which was already an open secret. In summer 1855, Shad stepped down as editor, frustrated that she could not gain more support from the black community in Toronto, and bitter by her reception as a woman editor. She turned over the editorship to Baptist minister William P. Newman, at least symbolically, writing on June 30, 1855, quote, To colored women, we have a word. We have broken the editorial ice, whether willingly or not, for your class in America. So go to editing, as many of you as are willing, and as soon as you may, if you think you are ready, unquote. Frustration with Toronto led Shad to move the publication of the Provincial Freeman to Chatham, close to both her former home in Windsor and where her parents and other relatives had settled in North Buxton. William Newman remained editor, while Isaac Shad took over as publisher, and Marianne, from behind the scenes, handled much of the daily work. In 1856, Marianne Shad married Thomas Carey, a barber who lived in Toronto, who had also been involved with the provincial freeman, and who had three children from a previous marriage. Marianne and Thomas had two children together, a girl named Sarah and a boy named Linton. For most of their marriage, Shad Carey lived in Chatham while Thomas remained in Toronto, although they traveled frequently between their residences. Running a financially successful newspaper was never an easy task, and Shad Carey traveled widely in both Canada and in the United States, at great personal risk, to lecture and to increase the subscriptions to the paper. By 1857, the financial situation of the provincial freeman was too precarious, and it ceased publication for a time. Shad Carey and her brother Isaac worked valiantly to keep the paper going, and by June of 1858, they were again publishing at least twice a month. But by mid-1860, it had ceased publication for good. After Thomas Carey died in 1860, Shad Carey's main income source was working with an integrated Chatham school run by her sister-in-law, Amelia Freeman Shad. Shad Carey was the principal fundraiser for the school. In 1863, Shad Carey's friend, Martin Delaney, convinced her to work as a recruitment officer to enlist black soldiers for the Union Army. After the war, Shad Carey moved to Washington, D.C., where she taught in the public schools for 15 years and served as a principal for two years. 
she enrolled in the law program at Howard University. And in 1883, at age 60, she became only the second African-American woman in the United States to earn a law degree. Shad Carey continued to write and lecture, promoting racial and gender equality, and she was important to the women's suffrage movement. In 1875, Shad Carey signed a petition claiming a woman's legal right to vote. She was one of 600 signers, and the petition was presented to the House Judiciary Committee. She joined the National Women's Suffrage Association and delivered an address to their convention in 1878. Later, she founded the Colored Women's Progressive Franchise Association to encourage Black women to fight for suffrage and equal rights. On June 5, 1893, Marianne Shad Carey died in Washington, D.C. She was buried at the Columbian Harmony Cemetery. To help us understand more about her remarkable life, I'm joined now by Dr. Jane Rhodes and Dr. Kristen Mariah. Dr. Rhodes is Professor of Black Studies at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and author of the book, Marianne Shad Carey, The Black Press and Protest in the 19th Century. Dr. Mariah is Assistant Professor of African American Literary Studies at Queen's University, and is a visiting fellow at the Center for Black Digital Research at Penn State, where her projects include digitizing Mary Ann Shadkari's papers. Jane and Kristen, welcome. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. We're delighted to be here. Yep, thanks. So I am super excited to learn about Marianne Shad Carey. As with many of the topics on this podcast, I'm embarrassed that I did not know about her before, and I'm glad that I that I have the chance now. I wanted to start by asking each of you how you got to know about her, how you got interested in her. Uh, and Jane, I know that that you've been interested in Marianne Shad Carey for a while wrote a book on her uh, quite a while ago now. So could you tell us just a little bit about how that project started? Well, it is a long story. I'll try and give you the (laughs) condensed version um, because Marianne Chad Carey has been a central part of my life for uh, about 30 years, quite frankly. So she was my dissertation topic. And the way that I came to her was that before I went to graduate school and became an academic, I was a journalist. So I was a young black woman newspaper reporter and I was seeking sort of foremothers, right? And role models. And um, there weren't any, uh, there were literally none written about except perhaps Ida B. Wells. Um, and there were very little about her. And I was doing an interview uh, with uh, the late Manny Marable, a great uh, scholar of uh, black history. And I told him this and he said to me, you know, you ought to find out about Mary Ann Shad Carey. And I was like, what? what? Who is she? <laughs> what is that? Um, and I dug around, and the only thing I could find about her at the time, this was in the 1990s, was a, small, a couple of pages about her in a book called Black Women in America by a historian named Gerda Lerner. Um, and it's called, sort of a collection of stories of, of famous Black women. And so that sort of sparked my interest. Um, I left journalism, I went to graduate school, and I really had in the back of my mind from the beginning that I wanted to write about her. And then I started the research, I did my dissertation. After the dissertation was done, I went back and did a lot more research um, because I wanted to flesh out this sort of broad contours of her life, not only her journalism career. And so, yeah, that's how she and I became intimately involved. Yeah, I love that. Uh, and how about you, Kristen? What what was your sort of introduction to Marianne Shadkari? Um, you know, I proposed an essay for a special issue of Theater Research in Canada about a concert that was given for Marianne Shadkari um, by Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield. And the paper was accepted. So I had to start doing a really deep dive. 
<laughs> and at the same time, I was also I'm sort of newly connected to um, the Center for Black Digital Research. And so I had the resources to really think about Mary Ann Ted Carey in depth, um, but I was also trying to incorporate Mary Ann Ted Carey into my teaching. And I was new to the institution that I currently teach at, and I really realized that for a lot of my students, um, Mary Ann Ched Carey was totally new. Even though we have right, amazing work that has been um, produced by people like Jane Rose and Ronaldo Walcott, um, it still hadn't made it into the curriculum by and large. So, you know, it was an opportunity for me to include Mary Ann Carey in my teaching and also to think about her impact in terms of Black feminist performance and Black women um, in a sort of a larger public sphere um, in the 19th century. Yeah. And so the, the question that comes up frequently on this podcast is, you know, why don't more people know? You know, obviously there are people who do know about Marianne Chad Carey, have been doing work for some time, uh, like you, Jane, but this isn't in a sort of, you know, household name, maybe like, I don't know if Ida B. Wells is in the broader spectrum. I certainly know, you know, have heard, have heard her name a lot. So, you know, why, why is it, uh, and it's not for lack of, uh, publications on her part. It's not for, you know, having lost her writing or something, you know, that is still out there. So what what is it about her or her life uh, that despite her huge number of accomplishments, we we just don't hear more that it, that it isn't a, a larger part of sort of everyday conversation? Well, I mean, there are a lot of reasons. I mean, I think the critical one is that really before the end of the 20th century, perhaps the 1980s or the 1990s, uh, there was very little written history about Black women in general, okay? Even more, um, more famous, arguably more famous, more accomplished than Mary Ann Shad Carey. Um, there was a, a general notion that Black women hadn't accomplished very much. And even when there was recognition um, that Black women had accomplished um, something and had uh, a history that was worth noting, uh, it was difficult often to find the records of those. And so there really wasn't until really the 18, 1980s and the 1990s when a small group of quite dogged scholars and journalists um, and amateur historians just started um, working on that project. And it's still going on today. I mean, we're still every day, every week excavating uh, amazing people like Mary Ann Chad Carey. So, you know, I think that that is a, a, a broad part of the challenge in telling these stories. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I really love the idea that um, Jane outlines in her introduction to Mary Ann Chad Carey, right, her biography of Mary Ann Chad Carey, um, right, that this material is out there, but there are really structural reasons, right, that uh, more people don't know about Mary Ann Chad Carey. And in fact, there were um, groups of people in Chatham, in Southern Ontario, um, who really cling to the notion of Mary Ann Chad Carey, who are proud of her, and who have been, you know, really pushing for a greater civic recognition of Mary Ann Chad Carey. And it's thanks to them that we have, you know, um, a, a couple of public schools and streets named after her in Southern Ontario. Um, but there's still a resistance to incorporating that history um, into broader histories of Canada, right? There's still this notion that she wasn't really Canadian, that the Black community that was here in the 19th century was very small, that they weren't really Canadian, right? That they were sort of outliers. Um, and so I think that there's still room to really push forth with this idea, right? That she really did make a powerful impact both in Canada and the US. Yeah, so maybe she's a person kind of both out of place that, you know, sort of Americans are like, well, her major work was in Canada and Canadians are like, well, she's American, but out of time too, sort of before... Uh, some of the movement, she, she's really sort of ahead of her time in a lot of ways. Did you find that, Jane, as you were sort of researching her, looking at her work, that that it was hard to sort of connect her to things that people are sort of writing about, like movements or places that, yeah. that sort of would, would anchor her a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think in general, you know, uh, people in the U.S. and I think probably also in Canada are pretty presentist. You know, we don't like to go that far back. Um, so when you go to the 19th century, for example, or the turn of the 20th century, it has to be really um, significant in very sort of traditional terms, right? And so she doesn't necessarily fit 
those traditions, um, one of the terms that's used is a woman worthy. You know, what makes her a woman mm -hmm. worthy? I think also she was, you know, she was an activist and she was a radical and she sort of pushed against conventions. So, you know, she irritated lots of different kinds of people, you know, and so often folks like that don't get sort of recognized and get celebrated in, in conventional ways. But I think a lot of it is also the record. She she does leave a record, but it's not in the obvious places. You know, it's not necessarily in, you know, sort of public uh, records um, so that, you know, it, it, public officials, for example, are enshrined in certain kinds of documents. And, you know, the average people and people outside of that domain uh, aren't found there. Yeah. Kristen, could you talk a little bit about the the work to digitize some of these records so that they are sort of in a in a more accessible format in a place that people can find her and, and can really experience her? Absolutely. And I think that, you know, if we're interested in thinking about, you know, Mary Ann Chad Carey's radical feminism, that's such an important place to look. I mean, I love reading The Provincial Freeman because on the one hand, it's just funny. It's hilarious. Um, so you'll have um, articles warning people um, who are newly immigrated to Canada, like not to throw snowballs because it could be dangerous. It could be ice <laughs> and you could injure the person, right? Who gets hit by a snowball, but also really insisting that it's important to educate your girls, right? Just as much as, as it is to educate your sons, right? And this was so outstanding and striking even then. Um, you know, part of the work that I'm doing right now with the Center for Black Digital Research um, involves digitizing the material that is currently held at Archives Ontario. Um, and, you know, Jane writes about this extensively in her biography, um, but it's still basically on um, microfilm. And it's largely um, illegible and not really accessible, right, to scholars who can't travel to the archives, right, and sit there for hours on end, right? And so part of bringing Mary Ann Chad Carey to the world and really helping others learn more about her and her legacy um, involves having this mass transcription project, right, which we hope will take place um, on February 14th in 2023. 2000 and or 2023 um, will be the 200th anniversary of Mary Ann Chad Carey's birth. February 14th is also Frederick Douglass's birthday. Um, so it's the convergence of two really important days for the Center of Black Digital Research. Um, and we hope that by um, placing these materials in the public and gathering people together to help transcribe um, this material, um, we'll begin this process of sort of making these records more accessible for the wider public. Yeah, especially in the time of COVID. I think we've seen, you know, with shutdowns of archives and stuff, how important it is to, to get as much of this digitized as possible. Uh, so I want to ask a little bit about the Fugitive Slave Act in the U.S. So this was in 1850, and it was hugely influential, certainly in Marianne Chad Carey's life, you know, as a sort of a, a momentous decision that she makes to move, but obviously is is hugely important in the, the lives of all African Americans. So I wonder if we could talk about that moment a little bit and what it means in American history and what it means specifically for Marianne Chad Carey. It, it is a really pivotal moment because historians sort of mark 1850 as being the, the moment in which the sort of entire political arc of the country is moving towards the Civil War, essentially. But, you know, the, the Fugitive Slave Act has made whatever mobility Black people have uh, virtually impossible. You know, about 10% of the Black American population at this time is freeborn, or they've emancipated themselves um, in some way or have been emancipated. And um, those folks have a sort of nominal freedom, but they do, they are sort of the foundation, the bulwark of the Black abolitionist movement. Right? So they're the ones that are holding the conventions, that are publishing the newspapers, that are uh, circulating the speeches, that are raising the money, who are you know, sort of conducting the Underground Railroad. That is the sort of foundation of the Black abolitionist movement. And then you have this law that comes along that makes it even more difficult for those individuals to be mobile to do that work and is incredibly threatening to the whole project of trying to free slaves. So it's that con concept and, and context that really propels many people like Marianne Shad Carey to, um, to think about an alternative, something that's unthinkable, 
You know, this is a, a period in history where people didn't easily emigrate anywhere, right? Um, much less, uh, you know, leave the United States and go to Canada. Um, and one thing that people don't often remember is that Black people, even though they are oppressed, they're disenfranchised, they are, their bodies are owned, they are brutalized, they still have a very close tie and identity as Americans. Right. And so, and, you know, as Frederick Douglass would argue during this period, this is our country and we built it, you know, um, and we are going to stake a claim to it. So, you know, Marianne is a part of a small movement of Black Americans who take a different stance. And they say um, America is hopeless. Um, we can do better work if we go to Canada. Um, and demonstrate that Black people can thrive and be successful. Um, we can repudiate slavery and the slave trade um, and, and racial degradation. So it, there's a lot of meaning in it. And, but she's take, very much taking a minority position within the Black abolitionist movement um, and, and a, a remarkable one, given that she's a single young woman. Yeah. I mean, well, one thing I would say to pick up on that is that, you know, when we read the plea for immigration, even though she is firmly right, sort of um, making a stance that we need to like cast our lot in with the British Empire, she also calls on people's knowledge of the United States, right? She says, you know, if you can make it in like Northern Ohio, Ohio, and you can farm there, you can also be a successful farmer in Southern Ontario, right? The skills that you have, the skills that allow you to thrive, right, in the sort of um, United States will also make you really a prosperous farmer, right, and a good citizen in Canada. Yeah, and she makes such a different argument, even, you know, versus other emigrationists of the time who are saying, we should go to Latin America, or, you know, we should go to Haiti, or maybe Africa. You know, this is a, a very different argument that she's making. I think one of the things that's striking is how much even among people who have the same basic idea at the time of what to do, they have such uh, such strong disagreements about how to how to do that. Even the people who want to go to Canada, uh, you know, fighting amongst themselves about how the best way is uh, to do that. Absolutely. I mean, this is a point that I try to convey to my students every semester, which is that Black people are not a monolith any more than any other group are, and they certainly weren't in the 19th century. And there was a vast array of positions and ideas. You know, there was a, you know, a, a consensus that people wanted to escape um, their um, enslavement and escape a system of uh, discrimination. But there were a myriad of, of strategies uh, that people were trying in order to accomplish that. And I think Marianne Chad Carey was very astute politically. Um, she understood that um, having a safe haven in Canada for Blacks where they could um, create sort of autonomous and independent uh, communities and institutions um, conveyed a very powerful political statement. That it repudiated all the mythologies of Blackness. The Black people couldn't do that, that they didn't have the intellect that they were uncivilized. Well, Marianne Chad Carey is saying, uh, excuse me, uh, here we are. And, you know, Canada is quite a fine place and we're doing quite well. Yeah. So we, we've we mentioned a few times what a sort of, she doesn't just try to make nice, that, that she's sort of very fearless in her rhetoric, that she's very outspoken. So can we talk about that a little bit and, and that uh, what that meant then for her to be like that? What, what it is maybe about her background uh, that can explain a little bit about why she was the way that she was uh, and, and what sort of space this then opened up for other Black women uh, who followed her. Yeah, I mean, from my present day perspective, you know, I'm often struck by the um, intense backlash in the press, both the Black press and the mainstream press um, against Mary Ann Carey at those moments when she insisted on speaking in public. And so she wanted to be an active participant in the colored conventions and she insisted on her right 
to take the stage in those spaces. And people got, you know, pretty nasty with her. They were very petty. So you read these you know, reports about her speeches and they comment on the tone of her voice. Um, not just what she was saying, right? Um, but the, even the tone of her voice, right? She sounds masculine to them, right? And it's not even about what she's saying. Um, it's really just about the fact that she had the audacity to, to stand up and speak, right, in front of this group of men. Yeah, yeah, I, that's really um, well put, Kristen. Um, you know, the, the gender conventions of the mid 19th century were that women were supposed to stay in the so-called sort of domestic sphere, right? And, and black Americans had this, you know, very contradictory impulse. Um, the great scholar, uh, James Oliver Horton wrote extensively about this, you know, this idea that, you know, black women have to be part of the sort of freedom struggle on the one hand, but they also need to conform to these kind of domestic ideals. They shouldn't speak up. They shouldn't be critical. You know, they should, um, you know, sort of practice kinds of deportment. We see this a hundred years later. Um, you know, it struck me that, you know, during like the Black Power movement in the 1960s and 70s and the Civil Rights Movement, we saw similar kinds of contradictions. And it took, you know, sort of confident um, and uh, ambitious women to to contradict that and to follow their destiny and to carry out their political project. Yeah, it's interesting that even while she is uh, is not really backing down ever, she is at the same time sort of understanding those gender dynamics when she puts together the provincial freeman and says, yeah, this guy's in charge, really. <laughs> it's not me. It's not a woman. Well, at the same time, she's, you know, really very much the one running the show. Yeah, I mean, she she was aware of it. Uh, by then, she, she, I'm sure, experienced so much sort of opposition and backlash that, you know, again, she always had to be strategic, right? And that was a strategic move. You know, she can run the paper and she can put a guy's name on the masthead and no one will know the difference. And of course, we know that eventually people do figure it out and she gives up the charade. But um, this is the way um, Black women and women in general, um, many of the women suffrage activists had to do the same thing. You either had to have the protection of a husband who was supportive of your enterprise. If you were single and independent, then you had to really circumvent this very circuitous route to um, have a public voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And can we talk some about, uh, about her marriage uh, and her kids? You know, I think when when I look at her story, I think at certain points, like she doesn't strike me much as a mother. And then I think, okay, no, I think that because it's the 19th century, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't think that uh, a woman who is, you know, a CEO or something in the 21st century wasn't much of a mother. So, you know, I, you know, it, it, I think that the marriage is the same way that a, a 21st century marriage where they were living in opposite places and traveling back and forth and stuff wouldn't strike us as that odd in a way that it does in the 19th century. Uh, but, you know, from from everything I can tell, they, they do seem to have very much loved each other. It wasn't sort of a, a marriage for political reasons or anything. Well, if I can plug the Archives Ontario fonts again, um, I would say that that's one of the things that really fascinated me um, about that collection of paper, right, is that there is correspondence actually between Mary Ann and Carrie and her husband. Um, but it is also one of the things that frustrates me um, about that bit of research, um, that they're not quite legible. Um, so I'm hoping that um, part of this collaboration and the mass transcription project um, that's going to happen in 2023 will actually allow us to have a greater insight into those kinds of relationships. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Kelly, I think you you raise a, a really fascinating point, which is I think we have this kind of mythology, you know, this imaginary of 19th century marriages when, um, you know, the reality is they probably often transcended those kinds of myths um, and that there was a lot more mobility when necessary and a lot more independence of women than we know. And that's why stories like this are so important. Mary Ann Chad Carey's story is a, a vital story, but um, it also tells us a lot about um, how many, many women sort of navigated the world during that time. Mary Ann traveled all over. She had small children. Um, she crossed the border, she came, she did speaking engagements, you know, she went to meetings and so forth. And 
while that was unusual, it certainly was probably more usual than we imagine or understand. Yeah, I think the uh, the interesting thing too is having such a big supportive family uh, seems to have been obviously was so important in the paper, but I assume must have also been important in sort of raising the kids and you know that that you have this this family network that that can help you know take care of the kids while you're on the road that sort of thing that that would yeah. have been helpful. Yeah, absolutely. They had a, a I mean, there were twelve. Uh, Shad um, siblings, and Marianne was the oldest. So I often thought, as I was, you know, sort of working on this project, that she played a significant role in raising her siblings. And then probably later on, she turned to them and said, "Okay, it's your turn now to help me raise my kids." So absolutely, yeah. So Kristen, you've mentioned that the 200th anniversary of her birth is coming up, and that there's the the transcription project. Uh, what are some of the other things that are going on to to help celebrate her life as as we near the 200th anniversary of the birth? Um, well, this fall we held a small symposium and um, we featured a lot of um, new research about Mary Ann Chad Carey and her life. Um, and we're hoping that 2023 will also allow us to um, publish this new set of research um, into Mary Ann Chad Carey and her work. I know that my colleagues at Penn State are also working closely with the Philadelphia Mural Arts Project to um, coordinate a mural based in Delaware. Right, um, that also celebrates Mary Ann Chad Carey. Um, I'm hoping for similar work in Ontario. And so, um, you know, it's nice to think about this renaissance of Mary Ann Chad Carey, um, new research that's coming forth, um, but also new cultural work that really publicly commemorates her impact. I, I think we could probably talk about her all day. <laughs> um, but uh, in lieu of that, I think that people should uh, should follow along all of these things. Uh, check out the the symposium from last fall. The uh, several of the panels from that are on YouTube uh, and can be checked out. And Jane, can you let people know how to get your book? Yes, the book is published by Indiana University Press. Um, so you can go to IU Press and uh, find the book. And we're hoping to bring out a second edition, um, which will be really exciting um, uh, to, to uh, tie into the uh, 200th birthday anniversary. Excellent. Uh, and it's a great read. It's just, a, she's such a fascinating story. Uh, and you uh, got into so much of the, the archives and the, the research and are really able to sort of pull at those strands of, of her life. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So is there anything else that either of you would like to make sure we talk about? I mean, we didn't even touch certain parts of love for life because of uh, uh, time. But if there's anything you'd uh, really especially like to make sure we talk about. I mean, I'd just like to highlight, which goes back to the reason why I started this in the first place, the, the active role that women, Black women have played as journalists, as, as creators of media. Um, because I think there is a sense um, until quite recently that Black women weren't active in this sphere, that they didn't have much control, but there actually is a wonderful history. And I think Mary Ann Chad Carey really uh, attests to, it takes perseverance, it takes creativity, it takes brashness, um, and maybe a little arrogance, um, but uh, it played a really vital role. It helped to building Black communities in Canada. It um, really probably saved the lives of hundreds, if not thousands of people who were emigrating, and it helped forge a political movement. So that's not nothing, you know, <laughs> in terms of the role of media and the press. And I hope that that inspires uh, young people to continue to do that work. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that um, has always struck me is that Mary and Chad Carey, it's really the perfect kind of figure to bring together scholars from both the US and Canada, right? And um, so much of um, the things that remain fascinating about her, right, are the way that she just sort of, she really lived along the borderline, right? And that she straddled both worlds and is con continually sort of reinventing what it means um, to sort of live on either sides of those borders. I mean, she's such an enigmatic figure. Um, I think that she's, um, she's endlessly fascinating. And I really hope that 2023 um, allows other people to sort of dive into her legacy in new ways. I love that. So thank you both, Jane and Kristen, uh, for speaking with me for all of the work that you've done. 
Uh, I'm so very excited to have learned about Marianne Shadkari, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to the, the ongoing celebrations and, and seeing the, the digital project. Thanks so much for the invitation. Yes, this was fun. Thanks for listening to Unsung History. You can find the sources used for this episode at unsunghistorypodcast.com. To the best of our knowledge, all audio and images used by Unsung History are in the public domain or are used with permission. You can find us on Twitter or Instagram at unsung underscore underscore history or on Facebook at Unsung History Podcast. To contact us with questions or episode suggestions, please email kelly at unsunghistorypodcast.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate and review and tell your friends. MSW.